Jackson debate. Dr. Thomas B. Warren, Ph.D., is professor of the philosophy of religion and Christian apologetics at the Harding Graduate School in Memphis, Tennessee. Dr. Wallace I. Matson, Ph.D., is professor of philosophy at the University of California at Berkeley. This debate was held at the Curtis Hickson Convention Hall in Tampa, Florida, on September the 11th through the 14th, 1978. We present the Warren Matson debate on the existence of God. The propositions for this debate are as follows. The first proposition reads, I know that God, that is, the God in the New Testament, who is to punish some individuals eternally in hell, does not exist. Dr. Wallace I. Matson is in the affirmative and Dr. Thomas B. Warren is in the negative of this proposition. The second proposition reads, I know that God, that is, the God of the New Testament, who is to punish some individuals eternally in hell, does exist. Dr. Thomas B. Warren is in the affirmative, and Dr. Wallace I. Matson is in the negative of this proposition. This production was directed and videotaped by Dr. Rex A. Turner, Jr., and by Dr. Curtis A. Cates, administrators and professors of the Alabama Christian School of Religion, Montgomery, Alabama. This film has been copyrighted and reproduced by the National Christian Press, Incorporated. Any reproductions, use, or sale of this film without written permission from the authorized representative of the National Christian Press is strictly prohibited. It's time for us to begin the Warren Matson debate. The way of preliminary remarks, I want to express my gratitude, I'm sure, for those of you who are here, those who have been here each evening to Dr. Matson, Dr. Warren, for being with us as we had the privilege to sit at their feet and to hear them press their particular positions. And I know that if you have been here each evening, you have gained a great deal from it. I want to express my appreciation to those in the audience who have been so far for this evening as we have asked that you abide by certain guidelines and to keep our audience orderly and decently as it ought to be. I want to express appreciation to those who have come from many miles to be with us on this occasion. To the many in the audience each evening who have expressed appreciation to me for the proceedings. And I in turn pass these expressions of gratitude on to our participants. There's one adjustment this evening in assisting Dr. Madsen. Ernst Lavin will be keeping time for Dr. Madsen. David Raleigh has been keeping time each evening for him, but he's hurt some ribs or a back or something. He's not certain what it was, but didn't feel like being with us tonight, so we've had to make this adjustment. proposition this evening is the same as it was last evening. I know that God, that is the God of the New Testament, who is to punish some individuals eternally in hell, does exist. 
Affirming this proposition will be Dr. Thomas B. Warren, who is Professor of Philosophy of Religion and Christian Apologetics at the Harding Graduate School of Religion in Memphis, Tennessee. In the negative tonight is Dr. Wallace I. Madsen, who was last evening, Professor of Philosophy, University of California, Berkeley. Each evening we've had something to say about the copyright situation regarding the debate proceedings. There are tapes being made professionally. Incidentally, we understand that these uh, will be ready to be in your hands within 30 days. So if you get your order in as soon as you can, within 30 days you should have the tapes of the debate. There are appropriate order blanks for this. This one is for the tapes. The longer order blank is for the pre-publication of the book. All the charts, all the questions that each participant is giving to, to the other, it will be in the book and you'll be able to study these in more detail than what you could in hearing the debate or listening to the tapes. So if you're interested in this, you need to pick up an order blank and get that information. Again, I want to say to the audience that we should remember the distinction between the auditor and the participant. Dr. Madison and Dr. Warren are the participants. We, the audience, are the auditors. Hand clapping and all audible reactions of any kind are strongly discouraged. We want each evening's activity to be orderly, decent, and characterized with dignity and seriousness befitting the subject under discussion. The nursery, again, we call attention to in the Florida room. Should you need it, it is not attended. You'd have to be there with your children yourself. But should you need such, it is provided. And if you'll find one of the ushers, they will guide you to that. Since Dr. Warren is in the affirmative this evening, as it was last evening, we now turn the floor to Dr. Warren. Gentlemen, moderators, ladies and gentlemen, in spite of the fact that time is very precious, I do want to take just a moment to express my appreciation to Dr. Madsen for his having come to Tampa to be with us in this discussion and to make clear in all sincerity my goodwill toward him and to insist that you understand that in my pressing the various positions which he has advanced is no in indication whatever of any ill will upon my part toward him. I wish him well in every possible way, and I say that in all sincerity, and I'm sure that he feels the same way as I do in that regard. What we're doing here is each other. As I began again the second night of discussion of the proposition which has been read in your hearing, I know that God, that is the God of the New Testament, who shall punish some individuals eternally in hell, does exist. It is altogether in order that I bring before you, at least very briefly, some of the things that I established last evening. And I should like to point out, first of all, from chart number 4i, that Dr. Madsen has already, in effect, admitted that my proposition is true. I pointed out this argument last evening in the light of his admissions of the questions of the first evening that human being now living, or any human being in the past, was ever born of any ape or other non-human thing, nor was any human being now living or that has ever lived on earth ever transformed from any ape or any other non-human thing. And this argument shows the significance of that admission. In the first premise, we find that human beings owe their ultimate origin either to the creative activity of Almighty God or else to evolution. If it is by creation, then it is by God. This is obvious since there can be no creation without God. If it is by evolution, then it is either by birth, as I've indicated, or by transformation. If evolution is true, then it must be. If atheism is true, then these are the only possibilities. But Dr. Matson has admitted it is not by birth in premise four, not by transformation in premise five. Therefore, by conjunction of those two true uh, premises, in six we have, it is false that by birth and it is false by transformation. Then by the logical move of De Morgan's theorem, we have it is false of the disjunction 
It is false either by birth or by transformation. Therefore, by Propositions 3 and 7, we have the conclusion that evolution is false. For when the consequent of an implication is denied, then the antecedent is denied, and that's the case in premise 3, as you can see, that evolution is the antecedent. Therefore, it follows from Propositions 1 and 8 that either by creation or evolution, if one of the disjuncts is denied, then the other must be true. When any disjunct is true and one of the disjuncts is denied, then the other disjunct must be true. Therefore, creation is true. Therefore, God follows from Propositions 2 and 9. If creation, then God. We've established creation, therefore God. And if God, then creation, then atheism is false. Therefore, atheism is false since we have established God. In the second place, in 70A3, that is chart 70A3, I pointed out that all that Dr. Matson had had to say in this question amounted to his argument on pointless suffering. Namely, that if there is pointless suffering, then there is no God. He then alleged there is pointless suffering and therefore concluded there is no God. I pointed out and proved and went to considerable length to prove it that premise two is false. Therefore, his argument is unsound and the conclusion does not follow. I established this in chart 36 U, in which I set forth the basic affirmation of theism and argument from evil, it's sometimes stated. Basically stated, it is erroneous to conclude as do atheists that the existence of evil in this world proves that God does not exist. Dr. Matson envisions evil as being pointless suffering. I'll not take the time to discuss these again with you, but now call your attention to 36 U2 in which I have given that along with 36U3, the 22 propositions considered relevant to this problem of the argument from evil, and showed that I have set out all of these, and that no logical contradiction obtains between any two or among any number of them. Now that stands unassailed. Now I showed you in 36U4, and incidentally, even though we are going rather rapidly over these charts now, we have gone over them carefully. And they will be in the book for you to study carefully and at length. I pointed out that if each of these 22 propositions is true, or even if it's possible for them to be true, then Dr. Matson's case falls. For he must show that at least two of them are in contradiction with one another, and that he cannot do. I showed further in my counter-element of this basic affirmation of theism in chart 36U9 that atheism involves subjectivity as to morality. That means that if atheism is true, then if one person holds that fornication or adultery or homosexuality or group marriage, community marriage, trial marriage, uh, seasonal marriage or whatever, any sort of relationship among the sexes or anything else for that matter from all ethical nature is simply according to each one's own individual opinion. Now, since subjectivity, therefore, implies logical contradiction, as you can see near the bottom of the page, M and not M, or A and not A, or whatever problem may be at stake. But since any M and not M is false because it is a logical contradiction, it therefore follows that subjectivity is false. And since subjectivity, as a consequence of atheism, is false, then atheism itself is false, and this proves that Dr. Matson's position is false. Therefore, I've shown that he has admitted my proposition to be true, and by implication, has admitted that his own is false. Now, by way of a positive uh, affirmation of my proposition, I showed you the basic approach in chart number 96A, in which I showed general revelation. God deals himself to man, basically one argument, but can be uh, subsumed under these two general headings, general revelation and special revelation. Under general revelation, the world, taking the world, the physical universe in its entirety, or man, or special revelation, the Bible, the sacred scriptures, which, among other things, reveal Jesus Christ. But by the shaded area on this chart, I showed you that I was zeroing in, as it were, on man. Thou multiplied thousands, perhaps millions upon millions, of evidences that we could use in proof of God, but I have chosen, because of the limited time in this discussion, to concentrate upon man. We could prove the Bible to be the Word of God, we could prove that the Bible itself, simply as a phenomenon, proves the existence of God. But that is not our approach in this discussion. I show that I have deduced from man himself the existence of God. 
The argument which I gave has done that. In chart 96b, I showed how the concept of God in connection with the concept of God is a would have created and an actually existing human being. Notice that my reasoning is not from a mere concept, but from a thing that actually exists as contingent. And to say that something is, con is contingent is to say that it cannot account for its own existence. It depends upon something else for its existence. A thing exists non-contingently or necessarily is a thing that exists that is self-existent. It is of the very essence of God to exist. God does not cause. God did not cause himself or was he caused by anything else. But all of us as human beings are contingent. Therefore, this combined evidence properly reasoned about leads to knowledge of the fact that God does exist. Then I showed you on 96C a carefully formulated argument. If there is even one characteristic or property of even one human being, Dr. Matson saw, perhaps honestly, but at any rate, he missed the point and tried to pitch the argument as if I were arguing about the whole world, even though I'd made clear to him that while that could be done, it's not what's being done here, and it's his responsibility to follow me in this discussion. I'm saying that if there is even one characteristic attribute or property of even one human being, which could have come into existence only by the creative power of God, then that one human being constitutes proof that God does exist. I then insisted in the second premise that at least one characteristic attribute or property of at least one human being uh, could, does possess, which could have come into existence only by the creative power of God. And that therefore one human being constitutes proof when the evidence is recognized and reasoned about correctly that God does exist. I note carefully in connection with this argument that it's valid. That means if the premises are true, the conclusion must be true. So if the premises are true, and I showed last night that they were, then the conclusion must be true. Now I showed you in connection with 96D the importance of the circulatory, respiratory, or the cardiovascular system of each individual human being. I showed that a man with his nose and mouth taped up could not survive longer than five minutes. Then on 96E, I showed you the circulation of the blood between the heart and the lungs and the rest of the body, showing that man cannot live without this interchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide for more than five minutes. And I indicated on 96F and succeeding uh, chart, tailed this interchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide, showing that it simply could not have been a result of evolution. And therefore, it demands the existence of God. Now, in response to these matters, Dr. Matson showed the utter falsity of his own position and the truth of his mind by his complete failure to deal with the eternality of matter, with the matter of life from non-living matter, with human life coming from non-human life. And let us note now chart number 38F. Number 38F, in which we will... Look at the fact of the fact that a given Dr. Matson's position at one time, there was only non-living matter. Then there had to be the step from non-living matter to living matter, but which was not yet human. And then there has to be the step from living matter, which is non-human, to living matter, which is human. And I pressed him on the point not to talk about when, but how this occurs. How non-living matter to living matter, and from living matter which is not human to that which is human. There has to be this moment in time at which there is a change from human or from non-human to human. And there is simply no way that he can deal with this. Let us now add to that same point the evidence of the human reproductive system as you find on this chart. That which is living or non-living and non-human, then living, but non-human, but without human sexuality. Now let him explain how the human reproductive system has come along with the fact of human life and the identity of human beings as human beings. I've already defined both God and human beings in some detail. Now I want to turn to the um, 
Next argument that I will give in the sustaining of my case, what I have shown thus far is that God is the self-existent, the non-contingent being, based on the implication of the fact that we as human beings exist contingently. Now, I've established that. I did that in detail last evening. Now, on chart 36Y, I note in the second place that God is good. The goodness and the severity of God in relation to the atheist argument from evil. But now let us look at the fact of the goodness of God from what the Bible says about it. We're talking in this debate about the, the God of the Bible. Just as a matter of fact, we were in my debate with Dr. Kluge. The goodness of God. The Bible teaches in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 9 and 10, that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He does not want a single person to perish. He loved each one of us so much, every person in this world, of every nation. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And the Lord Jesus Christ, we're told, Philippians chapter 2, have this mind in you, which also was in Christ Jesus, who existing in the form of God, counted not the being on an equality with God, a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. And 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, though he were rich, yet for your sake he became poor, that ye through his poverty might become rich. Romans 8, 32, God gave to us the greatest gift of all, his son. Therefore, we can reason from that. If God will give us the greatest of all, he will give us whatever else we need. Matthew chapter 7, 7 to 11, Ask, and it shall be given. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened. There is Bible teaching on the fact of the goodness of God. And we'll come later to the latter part of that chart with the justice of God. Now let us note on chart 68. I am continuing now with the point that God is good. This is the second point in my basic affirmation. I have established in the first argument the self-existence of God. I am now dealing with the goodness of God. Now let us note moral codes in God. This divided into two main parts. Part number one. Notice again the precision, the logical presentation. If the moral code and our actions of any individual or society can properly be subjects of criticism as to real moral wrong. That is, if you can really say, look, this really is right or this really is wrong. Not really expressing an opinion. Not really saying, can't you see that? Don't you see? Uh, don't you agree with what I feel? But if there is some real objective reference, if it can properly be the subject of criticism as to real moral wrong, then there must be some objective standard, some higher law which transcends the provincial and transient, which is other than the particular moral code and which has an obligatory character which can be recognized. Secondly, the second premise, the moral code and our actions of any individual or society can properly be subject to criticism as to real moral wrong. For instance, the Nazi society, for instance, the Russian society, for instance, the Chinese of the communist China and of Cambodia and so on and so forth. In fact, even our own nation, the action of our own nation, the action of every individual is the proper subject of criticism, of evaluation. The conclusion, therefore, there must be some standard, some higher law, which transcends the provincial and transient. That is, that transcends the law of a certain geographical area, of a certain period of time, which is other than the particular moral code of any individual or society, and which has an obligatory character which can be recognized. That's why the German Nazis, in their terrible treatment of the Jews, and the communists of their terrible treatment of non-communists, cannot simply say, but we have made our own law, we are obeying our own law. There is a higher law that transcends that, by which they may be called to account, and as a matter of fact, most of humanity recognizes that to be so, and all deep down, even as Dr. Matson tonight, recognize that he has an objective moral obligation. He knows he ought to do some things, and he ought not to do other things, and he answered that in the questions tonight. Now notice in part two, now I'm using the conclusion of part one as the, as the premise of the second part. If there is some objective standard, that is some higher law which transcends the provincial and transient, which is other than the particular moral code of any individual of society, and which has an obligatory character which can be recognized, then God exists. There is some objective standard, some higher law which transcends the provincial and transient, 
which is other than the particular moral code of any individual or society, and which has an obligatory character which can be recognized. Therefore, God exists. Now, Dr. Matson, I suggest that you take this argument up and deal with it item by item, that just a wave of the hand with a sort of an aside will not answer it. It is formulated very carefully and precisely, and it merits that kind of attention. Now notice in chart 68K, Dr. Matson said he didn't want to talk anymore about the Nazis and uh, blaming if indeed I held a position which he does, for he has no basis upon which really to say that they did wrong. They said we did right. He says, no, I feel you did wrong. They have just as much to say what they feel as he does to say what he feels. Their defense was our government demanded it, our law. We felt it was right. We were doing the right thing, just as the communists, no doubt in Cambodia, feel they're doing the right thing to eliminate all non-communists. But they were accused and tried and convicted on the basis of a higher law which rises above the provincial in transit, and that must be the law of God. Notice in chart 68M, moral progress and moral degeneration. Notice the Germany prior to 1933, the people of Germany were hungry. There was moral degeneration to the time of their living under the Nazi regime, the law of Germany of 1933 to 45. Following that, there was moral progress. The Germany of today is not the Germany of Nazism. But the Germany of Nazism committed terrible crimes, and they were tried by a higher law. Notice up in the middle of the chart, the higher law, which transcends the provincial and the transient, as Prosecutor Jackson indicated, and as Henry Kissinger in another statement indicated, as I recall, recorded in Time magazine, indicated that some nations violate the fundamental standards of behavior. There is no way you can explain this. There is no atheist who wants to get away from objective reality. He wants to claim objective moral uh, behavior, but he has no basis for doing so. The only basis by which the Nazis could have been condemned is the fact that there is a higher law above the law of Germany, and that law could be only the law of God. Chart 68N. Well, we'll continue along and have a just a little later. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. If Captain Steve is in the audience tonight, I'd be very much obliged if he'd look me up at the intermission. I feel no temptation to follow Dr. Warren in becoming a broken record myself. I shall instead fulfill the promise or carry out the threat that I made last night to attempt a lecture on evil. I've already explained how ill-equipped I am to do this. Furthermore, I have no slideshow, not even a blackboard. But as we all know, if we watch The Late Show, when somebody gets appendicitis in the submarine, the medical petty officer has to operate. I beg your indulgence in this, and uh, I hate to see this transcribed forever because it will be used against me, but that can't be helped either. I did make some remarks last night about evolution being a carefully worked out cooperative attempt to explain certain facts which could not otherwise be explained in any plausible manner. I shall now try to expatiate on what those facts are. I shall divide my lecture into first some talk about the evidence or the facts that need to be explained, the various attempts to explain them, and then I shall give an overview of conclusions. 
In all this, I shall attempt to give some answer to Dr. Warren's questions about the eternity of matter and all those things that I have been again accused of simply ignoring. All right, now as for evidence, we can distinguish this into, or at least I have distinguished it into three general classes, evidence accessible to all of us. Second, the evidence of geology that I suppose isn't accessible to all of us, except insofar as we go to museums. And uh, third, the evidence which, while it occurs now, has only been noticed by special investigators. Now to begin with the evidence accessible to us all. This simply consists in nothing more breathtaking or out of the way than the obvious affiliations of the plants and animals that we all see all the time. That is to say, cats and tigers are very much alike in many ways. So are salmon and trout. So are various species of oak tree. So are redwoods and dawn redwoods. Many dogs look like many foxes more than many dogs look like many other dogs. Simple things like this. These have been noticed by everybody since people have been noticing anything. And it's sort of enshrined or encoded in the commonplace remark, I don't know who first made it, that nature makes no leaps. Serious and systematic attempts to study the affiliations of nature begin, I think, with Aristotle. Dr. Warren doesn't like me to bring up history, but I'm going to do it just the same. But just briefly, Aristotle, who founded so many things and brought some of them to perfection, is also the founder of the science of biology. And he made the first attempt at a systematic classification of animals and plants. His students carried this on, particularly Theophrastus, many of whose works are unfortunately lost. And it was a going concern in pagan antiquity. This sort of classification, which is all familiar to us from reading the tags on the plants in the Arboretum into genera and species, uh, is something that has accumulated history and was that is, the principles of this classification come to fruition pretty much in the work of the Swedish botanist Linnaeus in the 18th century. Now, this fact that you can construct a sort of tree showing the obvious relationships in skeletal structure, in innards, in habits, and so and so on and so forth for animals and plants can suggest many things. One thing it can immediately suggest is that these things that are so much alike probably had some common origin. There's a family resemblance to them, so perhaps they are descended from the same family. That thought, which is the leap essentially to the thought of evolution, was made extremely early in the history of European rational thought. In fact, it is to be found in the, no later a figure than Anaximander, who flourished around uh, in the latter part of the 6th century BC, who talked about the descent of animals, the affiliation of animals, the uh, uh, transference of life from the sea to the dry land, and the evolution of man. It's amazing when you think of it. But another thing you can, that can occur to you is not that these have a common descent, 
but that they just do form some kind of great chain from the lowest to the highest, from the inorganic matter to the worm and from the worm to the cow and from the cow to man. Unfortunately for the history of science, Aristotle tended to adopt that view. He was impressed by the fixity of species, that is, that the species breed true. And he felt that views like those of Anaximander were rather irresponsible speculation. As it happens, Aristotle was wrong and Anaximander was right. But still, Aristotle was perhaps the more rational, on the evidence available to him, that was perhaps the more rational conclusion to come to. His view was that all these things had existed in pretty much the same form forever. There was no beginning. Well, the evidence that was available to Aristotle is to us, and that, and that is, is easily available and uh, hasn't been either added to or subtracted very much. I come now to the evidence of geology. And there's a preliminary to take up, which has not to do uh, itself exactly with organic evolution, but which is necessary for its comprehension. And that is the geological dating of strata. It was discovered in the latter part of the 18th century, or someone had the idea, that the strata of rocks, which are very easily observed in many parts of the world, that is, you see a rock and it's cut through, and there's just layer on layer in it, that these strata were produced by sedimentation from water. I can summarize an awful lot there, and indeed I don't have much information to go in between anyway. Anyway, Lyle and others had the notion that if these rocks were sedimentary, that is, they were formed by the sedimentation uh, over ages when they were at lake, in lake beds, well, we can measure right here and now a sedimentation rate and so by extrapolation, we can find out how long it took to form those strata. The answer was quite surprising. Uh, even as early as Buffon, the French naturalist, it was thought that Buffon published figures which he thought that perhaps the age of the earth must be as great as 70,000 years. And in unpublished notes, he even suggested 400,000. I think those notes were unpublished because even the 70,000 led to such a great outcry. This is one of the beginnings of a great conflict between science and religion. Because the orthodox view was that you could date the history of creation and of the earth from the Bible. Archbishop Usher had computed it, had computed creation as having occurred in 4004 BC. He got it more exactly than that. It was in October, if I'm not mistaken. And it seems to me October the 12th. So I, maybe I'm mixing it up with Columbus Day, but I'm pretty sure it was 10 in the morning. Well, Usher here was only culminating a lot of researches of this sort, and this was a rather orthodox figure. And consequently, biblical accuracy was thought to be threatened by outlandish figures like 70,000 years. Nevertheless, in spite of opposition, this view, at any rate, got established in the scientific community. Namely, that the Earth is much, much older than one would judge by simply totting up the generations in, in the Bible. The second point I have to notice in terms uh, of geology, and here I come to direct evidence for organic evolution, is that not only was it discovered that one could reasonably date straight up, but it was also noticed that these sedimentary strata very often contain fossils. 
You all know what a fossil is. A calcified uh, outline or mold of some living creature, usually, but not always, of the bony parts, which you can simply chip out of the rock and very carefully clean out and look at. Our museums are full of these. Since these fossils occurred in sedimentary strata, it was possible to give them some highly probable taste. I must emphasize that there were very many fossils. Uh, they're not at all uncommon. You don't have to search very far to find fossils. But something very interesting was noted about these fossils, namely that many of them, the majority, the vast majority of them, skeletal structures or show skeletal structures that are not identical or even very similar to any presently, the skeletal structure of any presently living creature. Now they were pretty obviously the remains of living creatures. They were after all skeletons, most of them. Some of them complete outlines such as a fish or plant, plant leaves or whatnot. But they couldn't be equated with present day trout or oak trees or whatever it might be. So the conclusion was just about inescapable that these were the remnants of life forms that were now extinct, that had existed way in the past, but no longer did. Correlative with this is the failure to discover in the lower strata any or very many fossils that could be correlated with uh, present day creatures. No men or even very man-like creatures. Nothing resembling very much, at least not obviously and grossly in size and everything else, a modern horse, etc. Now this, notice, was what first gave strong support. In fact, it would seem to me overwhelming support. You could hardly include anything else but that the fossils, the vast majority of the fossils, were the remains of creatures that used to exist but didn't any longer, but the creatures that exist now didn't used to exist. So there had been some change in the population of the Earth. There are no longer any dinosaurs, that's perfectly clear, but there are plenty of dinosaur fossils. This gave a great impetus to the notion that Anaximander had first formulated that the relation of living creatures is not that of a, of, so to speak, ornaments on a static Christmas tree, but rather of the very growing tree itself. Now, thank you. I should also mention, though this discovery came later, because the remains in question are quite rare, unlike most fossils. The fossils include bones of creatures that were more man-like than present-day chimpanzees, but more chimpanzee-like than present-day humans. Some of these remains were also found in association with fires. I don't mean fires, of, I mean the ashes of fires, and not forest fires, but bonfires, and tools, not to, <coughs> especially flint tools. The inference here was very easy to make, that these were creatures who, their bony structures were very distinct from the men that live nowadays, nevertheless had the use of fire and at least a primitive kind of tool. I think that that is a fair summary of the main outlines of the geological record. And all of this was discovered 
by the beginning of the present century. Though, of course, discoveries here continue to be made, and indeed, somewhat astounding ones, such as those in the Olduvai Gorge in Kenya, which has greatly increased our knowledge of primate evolution and consequently of the descent of man. The third thing I'd like to mention is some observations that were made by Charles Darwin when, in his circumnavigation of the world with the beagle as resident naturalist, he spent a lot of time in the Galapagos Islands. The Galapagos Islands, as you know, off the coast of South America, are rather far out at sea and rather far removed from each other. Darwin studied the fauna of the Galapagos, many of the forms of which, I think most of them, are not exactly like those found on mainland South America, though all of them resemble existing South American forms rather closely. He not only noticed this fact, but he noticed that the forms of certain animals, especially finches and frogs, differed from island to island in the Galapagos. The beaks of the finches, for example, uh, tended to be quite different on one island from what they would be on another. And this was also correlated with different diets of the finches on one island and another. The idea struck Darwin that perhaps these were the beginnings of species. His great book is called On the Origin of Species, and it was there that that idea struck him, that perhaps just, so to speak, leave the interbreeding population to itself for a while. It will take off in different directions, depending on certain factors being found here that aren't found elsewhere, etc. Uh, I have a moment left. Well, according to my reckoning, only half a minute, and this is a good place to stop. I'll continue with the attempts at explanation in my next presentation. Thank you.